Scars of Sweet Paradise, published in 1999, is a biography of the renowned rock singer Janis Joplin, penned by American academic Alice Eccles, who holds the Barbara Streisand Chair of Contemporary Gender Studies at the University of Southern California. In addition to chronicling Joplin's brief existence, Eccles paints a comprehensive picture of the counterculture in 1960s America, delving into its misogyny and dysfunction. Eccles dedicated five years to meticulous research for the book, conducting over 150 interviews to craft a richly textured biography, as praised by Publishers Weekly. The narrative unfolds chronologically from Joplin's birth in Port Arthur, Texas. Joplin's mother, Dorothy, exhibits cold and controlling behavior, urging her father, Seth, to maintain distance from his own family, including Janice. Dorothy openly favors Joplin's younger sister, Laura. As Joplin enters school, her experiences worsen with teasing about her appearance, academic prowess, and outsider demeanor. Port Arthur, being an oil refinery town, offers limited alternatives, compelling Joplin, as a teenager, to clandestinely visit blues and soul clubs in Louisiana. Developing a beatnik persona, Joplin insists on standing out. Joplin attempts college in San Francisco and later in New York, encountering heroin for the first time while living precariously. Eventually, she retreats to Port Arthur, making a final attempt to conform before permanently relocating to San Francisco in 1966 during the city's LSD-fueled countercultural peak. Joining the band Big Brother and The Holding Company, initially mediocre, Joplin transforms it into an extraordinary musical entity. The band gains a strong following in San Francisco, and Joplin becomes a nationwide star after their performance at the 1967 Monterey Pop Festival. While critics focus on Joplin's distinctive persona and vocal style, her sex appeal becomes a fixation for many. The LA Free Press even titles their review of the band Big Brother's Boobs. Despite Joplin's reluctance to leave her band, mounting pressure from fans, critics, and management forces her into a solo career in 1968. Her quest for a more soulful sound dictates the new lineup, but the change alienates her fanbase, and her debut solo album receives poor reviews. Simultaneously, Joplin grapples with personal demons. The insecurities and misery from her childhood persist, leading her to self-medicate with every drug offered, including unconventional methods like injecting watermelon juice in an attempt to achieve a high. Eccles carefully avoids sensationalizing or romanticizing Janis Joplin's drug use, highlighting that such portrayals have distorted the public's perception of Joplin over the years. Instead, Eccles emphasizes that Joplin's drug use stemmed from personal struggles, stating, no high could compete with her lows, with her conviction that she was worthless. Eccles maintains a delicate balance in discussing Joplin's sex life, acknowledging the singer's diverse relationships with both men and women. Joplin has often been depicted as insatiably bisexual, resisting conformity to contemporary societal norms. Eccles navigates through the romantic and sexual tumult of Joplin's life, notably revealing Joplin's living girlfriend, Jay Whitaker, while urging readers to consider the singer's yearning for what she termed her white picket fence dream, a stable life with a husband, children, and domesticity. This desire was fueled by memories of the bullying she endured as an outsider and nonconformist during her childhood and adolescence. Ultimately, Eccles concludes that Joplin struggled to embrace her success and its rewards, plagued by a persistent feeling of being an undeserving imposter throughout her brief career. Joplin's diminishing control unfolds against the backdrop of the American counterculture's transformation from a revolutionary political spiritual movement to a drug-infused and increasingly commercial phenomenon. Eccles underscores that the counterculture's liberatory ideals fell short of feminism, with hippie chicks expected to conform to roles like Earth Mamas or the supportive old lady of a band member. Even Joplin's ardent admirers expressed their admiration in sexualized terms, exemplified by Richard Goldstein's comment in Village Voice, to hear Janice sing ball and chain just once is to have been laid, lovingly and well. After her performance at Woodstock, where she struggled to dance due to intoxication from alcohol and heroin, Joplin disbands her first solo group and forms a new lineup called the Full Tilt Boogie Band in 1970. She records a new album, Pearl, a nickname of hers. Tragically, on October 4, 1970, Joplin is discovered dead in her hotel room, having taken a fatal dose of heroin. Eccles dispels the popular myth of Joplin choking on her own vomit or committing suicide, arguing that the singer had simply ingested heroin of greater potency than she was accustomed to. 
I hope you enjoyed this video, leave a like if you did, and be sure to subscribe thank you.